Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Rouge Rugby Podcast where we talk about real Canadian rugby. I'm Stu Hardy, joined as always by Derek Brissett. Derek, we've had another round of the pool stages at the Rugby World Cup. Guess which game I'm the happiest about. Ooh, um, England, England beating Chile. I know how much you like to see a English side really dominate. <laughs> um, you know, uh, the team that knocked Canada out of the World Cup, right? So you must be feeling great about that. I know how much you love to see England win. Yeah, uh, you're close. Uh, it was a team in red. Uh, that wasn't the team in question. Oh, but... Tonga. Tonga did really well. Yeah, actually. yeah. Tonga. Um, Tonga did. Again, close, but it was another team in red. And uh, mm. I don't yeah, know. I, mean, you know what? I don't know. Everybody's wearing cl- clash kits, so I have no yeah, idea what and... anybody's colors are anymore. I can't believe you haven't realized it was Georgia versus Portugal, the first draw oh. since Canada versus Japan back in 2011, as the shirt you're wearing. I'm guessing yeah. you did that in honor of the occasion. I, I I sure did. I sure did. Actually, I'm wearing it in the uh, honor of the last time Canada won a game because I'm sad. But yeah, you know what? Jokes aside, though, Georgia Portugal phenomenal game. Like that's a legitimate. Yeah. I feel like that's an a- actual answer to this question. I think it was a very like, very close game. It's one of those things. France of, Uruguay. Like, that was a great game too. Right? Yeah, that was. A good I mean, there was well. so there was so many so many games. Uh, that yeah, happened exactly. this weekend so like you could literally pick any yeah uh i'm actually gonna step away from rugby and talk about catering for a second because apparently a mr jones had to eat humble pie after his comments oh. about wales came to light and then oh. they proceeded to suffer their worst defeat to wales in history wales oh scored... did uh did australia lose i don't think anybody has mentioned that australia I, has lost i know i I was cautious about bringing it up, but apparently no one's talking about it. So, did, did Eddie Jones say anything interesting in his post match press conference, or did he just ig- ignore every question? Uh, lots of mate got thrown around, um, yeah. saying it's not rugby. Um, a lot of gestures. It's not rugby to ask the coach questions after a loss. It ain't rugby, mate. Yeah. And, um, you know, a few fines had to pay. You know, he has to repair his headphones after smashing. I think I'm like multiple pairs. Of, hey, you know where you can get some really good pairs of headphones is in Japan. Yeah. <laughs> On a completely <laughs> unrelated Which apparently language. he's going to very soon. <laughs> Don't ask him about that, though. Oh, absolutely not, mate. Yeah. Australia um, is definitely... Oh, what a time. What a time well, they're having right now. I will, I will say the last time a major tier one nation got knocked out of the pool stage at the following World Cup, they made it all the way to the final under the guide of uh, Mr. Eddie Jones. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not I'm not going to throw out the baby with the bathwater just yet, although yeah. it was very, very, very nice to see I mean, yeah. Australia lose. Hey, man. Also, also, you know, shout out Nick Tompkins. Those Sar- Saracens lads are really, really helping you guys out there. So, um. You know, uh, I, I don't know. I think Jack Morgan was doing absolute wonders. <laughs> you know, that Osprey uh, and now captain of the Wales team doing uh, fantastic work. You know, we never talked about the Osprey. What is up with the Osprey's new away kit? Like, what what is that? I never it's, asked it's you so about you know, the it's, podcast. Like, what what is that? So if you were to see it from a distance, you'd be like, oh, that's an Osprey's player. That's an Osprey supporter. Well, I I can tell that because they're know. they're crying dramatically. So I always I am always able to tell that from a distance. They're usually, I mean, against the Irish sides, yes, yeah, and the European sides. It, it's and like it some looks of the like South a, African sides. It looks like a hockey, a short sleeve hockey jersey. Like that that logo is is. If, if anything, that should that should be more reason for you to purchase one. Yeah, and you know what? That's true. I do like um, I do like rugby jerseys that look like hockey jerseys which also means i'm a huge fan of those new winnipeg jets rcaf jerseys those are great because they're basically arrows if the arrows were a hockey team mm. now um i don't know if you've seen those jerseys yet but um yeah. they're uh they're essentially they uh they look very much um my instant comparison to the arrows logo was it kind of looks like a winnipeg's jets logo and now the winnipeg jets look a lot more like the toronto arrows it's very very bizarre yeah. Um, no, actually, maybe that's one for the Arrows uh, merchandising team. How about yeah, you got Arrows rugby jerseys? Jersey? How about how about a hockey jersey for the we Arrows? We should do that, man. We should do that. That should be like a 
That's what they should. That we should get snow like a game in January, and then make the the team can play in the uh, or not January, February, but like and then the team can play a game in like a long sleeve jersey that looks like a hockey jersey. There we go. Um, Arrow, arrows, the, whoever's on whoever's on the merchandising team for the arrows, yeah. we will take our check in the post. I know, um, and, and a check from the MLR too. Absolutely. Well, um, you we know, you didn't mention the best game of the weekend though, like. The actual best game of the weekend, which, which is fall, South yeah. Africa, Ireland. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, you know, which in, is like you don't. But, but, but that's the thing. It's like if you know it's you know it's the defending champions versus the world number ones. If it was a bad game, we'd be talking about it. But we knew it was going to be a good oh, game. That's why so that is a good game. So it's like, yeah, it's it's like I'm happy, but I'm not surprised. If that makes yeah, sense. that that was honestly one of the best. That might be the best pool game ever in a rugby world cup. Like it was it might be. I I don't know. It's in the running or whatever. Well, I don't know. What else well, I re- remember last uh last World Cup we had um South Africa versus New Zealand in the pool. You know what? I actually I was like, that might be the best pool. You know, Japan versus South Africa was a pool. Oh yeah. That, yeah, yeah that's so- yeah, okay. I, I already I've already shattered this illusion. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, never mind. Never yeah. Um but either way, it was a that was a phenomenal game. The world number one versus world number two, it like the atmosphere made it feel almost like a knockout stage game. Maybe yeah, the singing of zombie as well. Incredible. Was, Incredible. To be honest, if you if you um, hear the Irish fans singing, it's either zombie or the fields of Athen Rye. It it gives you goosebumps. It's just yeah. Incredible. Oh man, that everything after the game was incredible, and it's like if that ends up being the final, because I suppose it could. Right? Mathematically, yes. Mathematically, yeah. So it's like if that ends up being the final, like sign sign me up. Like I would watch, I would watch like a best of seven series between South Africa and Ireland to determine. I will. I will point out now that historically, any team that has faced each other in the pool stage, when they go on to like meet up again in yeah. the knockout stage, the result is like the same not in terms of the score but in terms of who wins so well you know so, I, uh, irish fans will definitely be hoping irish fans will take that some of them might flip final. that though like i don't like i thought like the game was really good i feel like south africa kind of didn't play like their entire like kicking style that they normally do which is kind of well andre pollard wasn't in the match day 23 so yeah so i mean i guess he's he's still hurt i guess um i guess that was kind of a talking point right it was all the missed uh the missed kicks yeah malcolm marks out as well yeah i mean putting pollard into hooker is one thing but (laughs) yeah and i mean like the weird thing with that game too right like all the talk about the 7-1 split on the bench and what that game comes down to is a mall at the end of the game that ireland stops right having like the bomb squad come off the bench I still lifting up Eden Etzebeth like it's nothing. Yeah. Well, that's part of the thing, right? Like everyone's like, it's such a fascinating strategy, which is why I love it. Um, because yeah. it's like, you know, there might be a legitimate argument to be made that the best pack in the world is South Africa, and then the second best pack in the world is the South African bench, right? Um, like it's they're both up yeah. there, like they're both incredible, but there's everybody wanted to talk about like like oh like what if a center gets hurt and yeah like you know that's probably a problem and that's a risk i would imagine they just do the same thing that every team does when anybody gets hurt you just play a guy out of position like you f- you'll figure it out and you'll move on and survive and try to work with what you got um but the interesting but the more interesting thing though that i think kind of like looking at this game was like at the beth came off and like what the 40 something 50th minute or so right like yeah. Estebeth came off early Khaleesi comes off early a lot of like their big guns come off a lot earlier to get the extra pack out and stuff too which is also interesting because you maybe it, it might be great to have that fresh pack come on but it's also like because they're doing that they're taking some of the best players in the world out of the game, maybe a little bit earlier than another another team would without no, that's not using that strategy. So it's kind of interesting, like watching South Africa and how they're kind of deploying their players and stuff right now, I think is a super fascinating element of the Rugby World Cup and uh, yeah. probably one of the bigger stories. Obviously, another 
the other big World Cup story too um, is uh, like all the injuries to France and how that's going to affect yeah. them. Yes. We're trying to find out if um, Anton Dupont's uh, going to ha- be able to wear like uh, some sort of face shield, face protector thing for the. Yeah, I think it's I he's. If he can actually... wear that, that's huge for them. Yeah, I think he's de- he's of- he's out of action for the remainder of the pool stage. So I think it's only Just one more game for throw- France. Yeah. But it's it's the case of you know he's talismanic. He's the you know World Rugby Player of the Year, the consecutive World Rugby Player of the Year, and you know it's obviously that talismanic um, energy that he brings to the team. But I will mention that we've been talking about all these teams, but none of them are Canada, so it's not important. Let's actually talk about <laughs> Canada's performance this weekend against a team you've already mentioned, England, uh, as part of the two game series against England in preparation for the WXV that's taking place in mm-hmm. New Zealand and uh it wasn't the best showing of Canada uh, these teams obviously faced each other last year in the semi-finals of the Women's World Cup it was a much closer encounter that time round but you know you're playing at England's home or one of their home stadia and you know, the women are pretty fine and ready to go. Canada, you know, maybe they uh, just needed a little bit, a couple more days of uh, training together and so on and so forth. Because, like, straight out of the gate, England score a try within, like, the first two minutes. Uh, they get their second four minutes after that. It's not until the 10th minute that Canada gets uh, on the scoreboard. But, yeah, it's. I think it was a total of... Yeah, five tries to England within the first half, uh, eight overall. Canada getting two in the first half, two in the second. Final score, England 50, Canada 24. And you know what? I get it. You're world number four playing world number one, even if they're not like the world champions. They had, they're that impressive that they lose the World Cup final and they remain the world number ones. And. <laughs> Well, and, you know, and and you can argue, yes, this game means nothing because it's not part of the WXV. It's not part of World Cup qualifying or anything along those lines. So, you know, if, if you're going to make mistakes, this is the time to make mistakes. And uh, boy, were there some mistakes. Honestly, well, the uh, it's a tune up game, right? Like, yeah, it it is. Um, I think part of. Like, obviously, yeah, as you just said, there was mistakes made in the game. Um, you know, there's some missed tackles, some, uh, you yeah. know, missed passes, um, issues at set piece, um, right? All things that, quite frankly, can be fixed. I think it was kind of interesting how the commentary team throughout the match kept mentioning that, like, England has been training for, like, six weeks together. And yeah. Canada's on like, like nine days going into this game. Yeah. Or something what that was, right? Which I mean, if you want to circle back to what Sophie de Goody said at the end of the World Cup last mm-hmm. year, right? More resources, more games. Yeah, get more games, but more resources again, money, right? Yeah, um, could probably would probably help to maybe having a little bit more of a run up to the camp, but it also kind of, uh run up to the camp like in um in the world cup. And obviously they had a really good, they had a nice camp before the world cup. Then they had like, you know, obviously went through a great world cup campaign before they met mm-hmm. England and played England in one of the best rugby games of the last decade, really. Mm-hmm. And, but that was, you know, with Canada firing on all cylinders as well. Like after, you know, being in a intense environment for a few months and as part of the world cup, right. This is, you know, everybody's together for like a, like a week and a half, really, right? And yeah. England's being been together for six weeks, and I think it's like you can. I feel like you could kind of see that on the field. Like once it was pointed out, it was like okay, like England does look a lot more clinical. The you know their attacking patterns were causing problems. Canada was Canada looked like they they're playing their first game in a few months, which is obviously true. Right. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, coming off of a of a, a bit of a recent camp. However, it's like in saying that there's nothing that I saw in this game that gives me concern for WXV. 
which oh is no in a month away right also because it's like yeah it's the best in, england is the best team in the world and yeah. england has so many just star players like this oh god it's unreal um like in, they're they're unreal like even i don't know i kind of dis if you lose the world cup you're not the world number one anymore but other than that um they uh, they fully deserve that i mean they had uh what was their run like what was it like 30, 30 games. in a row 30 games yeah, in a 30 row games, like- yeah, and then yeah. and then you lost the most important one. That sucks. Yeah. Um, but That's, yeah. Yeah, it's very, very Tom Brady of you guys. Oh well, Tom Brady has like a bunch of other Super Bowls, but whatever. I'm a Colts fan, so I'm gonna make fun of the one time that he lost to <laughs> Peyton Manning's brother. Not even good enough to lose to Peyton Manning, just Peyton Manning's brother. But like I think there's like there's a lot of good like um England played really well. Like Sarah Byrne played really well, like Packer was playing really well. Um, Ellie killed Dunn, yeah. yeah. As a, Ellie killed Dunn looked double. like she had like the Super Mario star, just the yeah. and like nobody, nobody could touch her. That one try that she scored, and you're just like, you're kind of like watching like somebody, somebody tackle, yeah, please, please. somebody <laughs> please tie, and then it's just, just bouncing off of people, um, or like just so avoiding every like she broke like what four tackles on that one try, um. Like she played on real. Uh, she got player of the match as well, I believe. Right, that's what the bro- the broadcast awarded her player of the match. Yeah, yeah, I think she yeah. did. Um, um, yeah, but yeah, I th- and you know, as in like this isn't to like discredit like England. Obviously, they you know got their England. Pro- England looks, their, their professional England, setup I, is England looks doing very good. Like for the yeah. UX of E, like I feel like it to me it is going to be between them and the Black Ferns. I feel. Uh yeah, and also like like you said, like England. They, we just like we just said, they they went on a thirty game winning streak and then lost the World Cup. You don't think that they're thinking about that? Like, oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, like it's it's gonna be there's unfinished business for the uh, the Red. Yeah, Bulls. it's gonna like, there, like it's gonna be over. a it's gonna be a great tournament, I think, because there's but, lots of matchups that we want to see again. There's gonna be yeah. France, New Zealand, and the other semi final, which just came down to a misconversion or a miss penalty yeah. for the, for New Zealand to qualify. Then yeah. we have. Um, France, Canada, uh, repeat of the bronze final, yeah. and yeah, it's, and you mean Australia? Such a fun tournament setup. Yeah, I know it's going to be, but, like, yeah. it's yeah. going to be a blast to watch. And but as and actually saying that as well, I was going to, I was just trying to remember who the other team are playing, Wales. But for Wales, it's going to be a um, litmus test of where you're at. how their professionalization of the women's um, team is going because. They only started having professional contracts for Welsh players last year, yeah. and now, and you know, we've seen in the uh, women's Six Nations how, you know, having the professionalism helped them go up to third, which allowed them to qualify for WXV. Yeah, but that's going to be the test to see against like Canada, against um, Australia, against um, the Black Ferns as well to see like how far that has come along so it's good it's like all the games that canada are gonna have is gonna be oh it's great gonna be yeah it's it's gonna be amazing i'm very excited for this tournament yeah i think like i mean we kind of mentioned that um i guess you know i think canada can play a lot better than what they played in this game um yeah right i think which is i think a great reason to play these games before going wxv always nice to have some some tune up tune up games Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like the tries that they scored though in the game were all like pretty well worked tries. They were all great. I mean, to Tosi, um, just standard mall try, but like yeah. that was some some of Canada's bread and butter at the World Cup last year. Right, Peltier had a nice snipe again. That was off a of mall. Buka boom, just great forward work. Grant had some really nice skill plays. She finished off a great try as well. Yeah, we um, and we also had um some players coming back. So Taylor Perry. Yeah. Coming on, and that was uh, nice to see too, yeah. well, Magali Harvey getting that try saving tackle in that was uh, just such before, a sick tackle. Uh, yeah. just before Allen's try, unfortunately. But yeah, but yeah, we absolutely ignore the yeah. we ignore the try that happened after the tackle. It's the uh, that was a that yeah, that was a great play. It's great to have her back. That was she was doing commentary during the World Cup last year. Yeah, no, on, a... on TSN. It's uh, hilarious. It's great to have her back though. She was playing. Um, what she played? She played from uh, that Premier Sevens. She played for like the Looney. Yeah, was it the Loonies that she played for. I can't remember. I, which I don't. I can't remember which team it. But for 15s, she's playing in France, I believe. 
yeah um well i think that's the other thing too right like um yeah. also shout out to the greatest player of all time sophie de goody as well um yeah. had some uh some did some great work around the breakdown stuff unfortunately went two for four off the tee but um again it's uh, still a it's a game that player. it's a game that uh doesn't uh matter in the sense in the long term but you know it's a game where you can we're like uh, get rid of the up. rust and uh, yeah, Stu. We are a podcast. If we're not overreacting to every, yeah. we're not doing our job. But yeah, like I think this is a great game. I mean, I like I don't know if it's like just because like this is Canada, but I'm almost like I'm really excited for like women's rugby right now. Like oh yeah no it's a it's a great time to be a fan of women's yeah rugby. like go through the WXV and then when WXV is done like I'm excited to see all those players go to uh, the Premiership Women's Premiership yeah. Women's Rugby P I can't, yeah PWR yeah, PWR right Premiership Women's Rugby uh, yeah. which was previously the Premier 15s right and it's like there's mm-hmm. seems like like the Premier uh, Premiership Women's Rugby is like becoming like a competition where like the best players from around the world seem to be kind of making it a destination or the very least best players in Northern hemisphere. And like, that's going to be, I think that's also going to be super exciting because all of, and also fascinating because all of these players are going to basically spend a full calendar year playing against each other with or against each other, depending on uh, what side you end up on in PWR too. So they're all kind of going to get to know each other a little bit and uh, yeah. make all the, uh, the matches. Yeah. A little you know, pick up, pick up a few things, see what, uh, yeah. certain players are doing, find their weakness. I mean, yeah, uh, find their you weakness. know, utilize what their strategies are and get the, uh, get the ammo for the in-game chirping. Um, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. exactly. Right. And do all of that. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's an unreal time, um, to be, a, a, like, it's an unreal time for women's rugby. Like, it's really, it's really genuinely, like, exciting. And, like, even though, like, the World Cup is happening right now, um, it's also, like, the stands were kind of, like, they looked pretty packed in Exeter, too. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, um, and it's, like, and, like, that game, that, like, that game's conflicting with, like, World Cup games. Yeah, and people are still like packed, and people were like watching it here, um, in Canada. The fact that it's on YouTube was also nice. Um, yeah, that was great. Might, yeah, we might get into that. some YouTube versus TSN things later, but like, um, <laughs> but I think like the fact that it was on YouTube was awesome too, and like full games still up on YouTube. You can watch replays of it and stuff. It's like really well done, um, production wise and everything. Um, they're at the. Uh, they're heading to a Sophie to Goody's home next week, though. Stone X. Yeah, Stadium. heading to Stone X Stadium. Yeah. Home of Go. Saracens. Where, if you haven't noticed, red and black teams seem to kind of dominate theirs, too. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm on that one out there. Red and black teams yeah. that, specifically red and black teams that also have Sophie to Goody on them, tend to do really well at Stone X yeah. Stadium. So, and that game is available. I believe on YouTube as well as on TSN Plus, which I don't understand. To be I I don't understand it either, but I'm also not going to complain about it. If they don't geo block it, then that's their problem. But that's not. the thing. Like, what's the point of it for TSN if I can just watch it for Dude, free? Dude, shut up, man! <laughs> Stop yeah. putting it out there so, so someone yeah, realizes. I'm so, con- I'm so confused by broadcasting things this week. I don't understand what's going on with the world. Uh, we'll, we'll get on to we'll some get, broadcasting okay. news in a minute. Later, but later. First, okay. We're going to bring it back. We're gone from England. We're talking about Canada and England. Let's talk about Canadians in Canada because the Arrows have continued their roles of re-signing players. And we have two since the last episode of the podcast. Those are Mitch Richardson and Jack McRogers. They have both re-signed for the Arrows. Both players eligible to get their 50th caps in the 2024 season. Uh, Richardson says, I'm very excited to come back for another season with the Arrows. I'm looking forward to the challenge of overcoming last season in our push for the Seals this year. Bill Webb was a massive part in rugby in Canada, and his loss is one we all feel deeply. As Arrows, it is our duty both this season and in perpetuity to honor his legacy by continuing to help grow the sport of rugby for our country, our fans, and ourselves. And Jack McRogers had this to say, I am very proud to be back playing for the Arrows this upcoming season. I love this city and this club. We have big goals for the 2024 season, and I look forward to getting to work. 
you know, uh, McRogers definitely hoping that he'll have more game time this season as opposed to last. But I've, from what I've heard, that is due to school commitments he had last year. So he wasn't uh, completely available. But, you know, maybe with the new head coach, whoever that is yet to be announced, yeah. uh, you know, gets more time playing up front. And we know just how good Mitch Richardson was. He was, uh, I believe, voted like the player's player of 2020 yeah yeah um yeah he was yeah players player he um t- f- in my opinion the most underrated player in major league rugby and you know it was nice to see him finally get a crack with the national team um in uh that series against tonga um mm-hmm. over the summer because i think like he's deserved that you oh, know yeah he, he's really good defensively he's got good attacking instincts um he's everything that you would want out of a center Right. And I mean, he can play a couple other positions too if you need him to. Ideally, a center, but utility yeah. uh, can be a utility. Yeah. Yeah. Defense. Exactly. He can play a couple other spots, like wing or something, but like, which is advantageous to a team. And, right. And, you know, w- again, this is like, we'll see like who the arrows continue to re sign or announce right when we get a better shape of the roster. But like, um, but I, don't see how why Mitch Richardson can't be like the guy at center, be like mm-hmm. the, you know the starting. You know, give him a, you know twelve or thirteen jersey. You can do both, right? So, um, I think I don't see like why he played fly half last year too, right? Like we, for... yeah, I think he had to step yeah. in for yeah. the game in New York. Yeah, again the game again in New York. Yeah, right. So yeah, he played fly half um last year too. So we can do that too. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, like, obviously an incredibly valuable player, but I think, you know, I, 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 I think he's one of the most underrated players in the league. I think part of that is, you know, I think he, he had a great, maybe individual season, but the arrows obviously being one in one thirteen and two last year, um, you know, doesn't necessarily help with the recognition from other fans around the league, but um, but I like I'm super excited to see what he's going to do. I think he's one of I think he's one of those players that has really like benefited a lot from MLR, right? Like coming in on the first year and he's developed his game over time. And I think is now after, you know, after a few seasons here is now I think he's now ready to be the guy um, in like the back line for the Toronto Arrows and, you know, be that yeah. attacking threat, be, you know, be that attacking threat, be that defensive stalwart. Like if, you know, it's going the other way, be able to you know, hang with um, some of the other big boys in MLR because there's a lot of great centers around the league. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, obviously we've been saying with, you know, the retirement of Mike Shepard and obviously we don't know like the full list of players coming in, but we did say that like the leadership group um, could be shaken up for this season. And I definitely think that obviously being with the Arrows since the start (laughs) obviously helps, but, you know, He's been around for this will be his uh, sixth season, and I definitely feel like he has that those leadership qualities that will be, uh, you know, looking to see to help guide the team uh, going on the season. Um, another guy who's been around since the start as well, uh, Jack McRogers, oh, yeah. the um, the leading try scorer for the twenty twenty two season, I believe. Yeah, twenty twenty. Yeah, what the team. Yeah. Was, yeah. Uh, same year he earned his first cap against uh, Spain. But yeah, he, you know, yeah. impressive stats as well. And the guy's only 24, so he has yeah, that's, plenty yeah. of time to flex his muscles and show how, uh, how he should be with the team. And uh, he should be starting games, barring injuries. Another guy that should be getting yeah. some more caps with uh, Canada, too, is uh, yeah. rebuilding and trying to figure out what's going on with the national team. But yeah. Um, yeah, well, no, excited to have yeah, one back. one thing I found out from the uh, press release is that Jack McRogers is the um senior men's team's head coach for the Aurora Barbarians. So... Yeah, I think he's been doing that for a while. Um, right, because I, th- I think he has, I think I feel like he's been doing maybe he hasn't been the head coach, but maybe, yeah, he's coach, maybe, you know, maybe he's uh, progressed from like a forwards coach to, I mean. Uh, Anyway, Jack, if you're listening or watching, please uh, message us and correct us of how wrong we are. Um, Regar- regardless, though, like that's one of the great things that the arrows are doing. Like, there's a lot of, um, like, there's a lot of arrows players that are like coaching. Honestly, I think having the 
um, coaching ability as well can also help you as a player. I mean, there's been countless player coaches in rugby's history that have, you know, benefited from being both the uh, student and the teacher in that regard. So, you know, um, I think uh, I think Jack is pretty uh, well beloved by the uh, Arrows fans, as is Richardson as well. So this has been like huge news. It's only the three, the third re-signing as of the recording of this episode. So of course, another one will be another one or two will be announced before uh, we release this. Um, but you know, it's. Um, I was actually going back and seeing. Um, the announcements of Arrows players over the years. And I think it was like a few years ago, they would just announce like three or four in one press release. But I really yeah. like the slow reveal. And yeah, it's, you know, absolutely uh, great to see that um, uh, these players are coming back. You know, they're obviously disappointed with last year, but they're using that as the fuel to keep them going this year. And, you know, the Arrows aren't the only team that have been doing um, player news. There's been a lot of action going on at the trade wire. Basically, lots of teams picking up the carcass of what was rugby ATL. And if you want to keep up to date on all the uh, non-Canadian trades, let's put it like that, uh, we definitely recommend following MLR Stats and uh, James Dealey on Instagram and social, oh, across social media. Yeah, you can find uh, out can when... Find- uh... Find out when the uh, entire rugby LA roster has been traded. Yeah, and then we'll be starting for. Yeah, rugby ah, LA. we're close. I think uh, I was talking to their owners, who I cannot name, but I think we're. Uh, they need to make four more trades, and then. Uh, the then f- they can afford us. Yeah, then they can. Yeah, they can afford us, and the uh, the front row is going to be me, you, and James. Nice. So that's what. Uh, that's what we're waiting on here. Okay, so. Um, okay, let's talk about MLR and uh, the World Cup and basically the media landscape at the moment. So it was announced last week that the Rugby Network will have the broadcasting rights for the United States. We don't believe it's Canada at this point. We believe those rights are still with Sportsnet, but they will have. The, but the Rugby Network will have the U.S. rights for the English Premiership for the next two seasons. So the current format with the um, uh, the Worcester Warriors, the Wasps, and London Irish uh, no longer competing in the league means that it'll be a 10-league format. So it'll be 96 games um, per season, and those will be available for free on the Rugby Network, which is huge news. I c- I'm, I'm stunned. Can we see it in Canada, though? Uh, I don't is that still know. going to be Sportsnet. The, I so this, this is, is going to lead into a very interesting conversation that I feel like has been well, happening all week. Well, this is the thing: the press release has only been mentioning the United States. However, some people have gone on the Rugby Network itself, and they claim that they can see uh, the broadcast dates for I'm do uh, Premiership games in Canada. Now, this just may be an error on. Uh, the rugby networks side in which they haven't geolocked it outside of Canada. So I can't confirm or deny at the moment. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want to upset anyone just yet. I'm, I will say I will err on the side of caution and say it's not available for Canadians at this moment, but when the uh, English premiership season starts, then we'll have a proper confirmation on its availability. I'm not seeing it right now looking at it. Looking at the rugby network website. Okay. Trinity Western plays UBC soon though. That's Ooh, live enough. That's, that's on the live and upcoming section. All right. Well there's definitely something to check out at least. Yeah. But you know this leads on to the conversation of media rights and this has come to the light if you've been watching the Rugby World Cup and being interacting on the social media and it seems that the World Rugby, the Rugby World Cup, TSN, are all refusing to engage with the modern TV, or should say the modern media audience. And the sense that online uh, rugby creators on Twitter, on Instagram, 
they have been taking footage from games for the World Cup and it's been instantly flagged and removed. So you can't see the content. You can't see any tries or anything along those lines. You only can view this through the official channels. That means that... And that would be fine if World Rugby and the Rugby World Cup and, to an extent, TSN as well, would actually update their content. So... People have been complaining that games highlights haven't been available for multiple days after World Cup games have taken place. And you'd be like, okay, so what's the reason for Oh, you know, they have rugbypass.tv. You know, maybe the uh, content is there. Nope, it is not there either. So it's really out. And when you compare it back to 2019, when you know, people were constantly posting about, you know, tries and action going on in Japan. This seems like a major step backwards. 2019 compared to the Women's World Cup, like 11 months. Yeah. (laughs) Like, you don't even have to go back that far, especially with like, especially with like um, TSN. Um, And I know, I know like a big talking point was some of the, uh, like where games are being broadcasted and stuff. We can get into that a little bit. I don't, um, I don't think it's that big of a deal of what channel they TSM puts things on, to be perfectly honest with you. But maybe that's just because I am somebody that um, hasn't paid for cable in like eight years. Right. So I stream maybe, everything. Maybe. Um, yeah. so I stream everything. We can get into that, though, if you want to. Um, mm. But I think um, but I think like part of it was like the thing that for me, from a TSM point of view, being in Canada right now um one yeah it it's incredibly annoying to see like like even like going through like a twitter timeline like there's no highlights or anything right i think um from anybody from like that's all you can only see stuff from the official world rugby account and it's usually kind of weird and random things um yeah but like that gaston mirez tackle which is a great tackle but seems like a weird thing to point out when highlights are hard to come by but it's um but just i just wanted to shout out gaston mirez and it's but i i think like part of it is just it seems like right now like this world cup to me just feel especially as a fan in canada feels like something where rugby fans and probably people listening to this podcast are passionately following mm-hmm. but no one else cares about yeah no i like, which is I fully agree with that. A, like a problem. And I think like obviously, um, you know, part of the discussion over the weekend and in Canada too was like, you know, that Ireland um South Africa game being, you know, just only on TSN plus, right? Biggest yeah. full stage game in like forever, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, people kept constantly comparing it to like what was on TSN one through five. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, there was that one joke about the amazing race because that was on one uh, a couple, one channel that was on for like half an hour before a CFL game kicked off, though. So I feel like the real thing that TSN put on instead of that game was Montreal versus Calgary CFL game. Which, yeah. And um, right. But it's like looking at all the things that TSN chose to put on, I'm like. Like, I don't know, like, is there an argument that the Rugby World Cup isn't bigger than any of them like there was a tennis tournament there's a ufc fight yeah. there was some sailing so, like there so was i will obviously so, dfl and ncaa football as well at least yeah. just for that game specifically but so in in from a media perspective from tsn's perspective they have already paid to have yeah. you know cfl rights they pay to have lo- all these cfl's American like their baby as well dude. yeah exactly that's so so they are they're always going to prioritize that yeah the cfl nothing's beating the cfl yeah but they've also paid to have you know these american sports or american teams on the channel as well you know they've paid rights either to you know nbc or fox yeah. or anything like that they've already paid for that um my guess is TSN bought multiple World Cup rights at the same time. So um, 2017, 2019, 2022, and 2023. And 
it's you know and you know the men's world cup for 2019 was in japan it was either for eastern time it was either 11 p.m or 3 p.m or 3 a.m was the kickoff times yeah. so when you compare that with like other sports going on it's you know not at a time that conflicts with anything that's going on in like canadian sport so it's not conflicting with the nhl it's not conflicting with the cfl that's, that's about the stuff. tsn tsn plus didn't exist either at the time so there's no need to promote this new app as well so like i said it's available so they can say okay it'll be on tsn4 or tsn.com and as long as you have a login you can watch the game and yeah. you know and that's fine yeah. but, and also you know canada uh, the men's team was in the 2019 I rugby think world that's cup. a really big one i think cuz yeah i think that's a really big a really big factor i think it's like i didn't i don't know if i realized how big of a factor i feel like that might be with especially with tsn because if you remember like i said go back to last year's women's world cup tsn was all over that oh yeah and um time zone maybe a little more favorable um wasn't conflicting with cfl games wasn't conflicting with you know whatever um taylor swift wasn't dating travis kelsey yet so yeah that wasn't taking up all the news stories um so it's um like there, there was obviously some other it's a bit of a slightly different landscape but like canada being in it because canada like tsn had an in-studio pre halftime and post-match show right mm -hmm. with uh like I, we just mentioned miguel um harvey was one of the commentators on that andrea burke was there um i think brian spanton did a couple games as well right yep. like they had um like they had a full out like broadcast crew with canadian former players right that were like analyzing the games they had the same broadcast crew do the other games at the tournament as well right like it wasn't like they just did this for the canada games they continued to do it for all the big games right and i feel like tsn like promoted it a lot more like i think that's one of the things too is like i don't think like part of the issue i think is i don't think tsn's promoting this at all yeah uh, it doesn't I'd... feel like it is right um, yeah. I was looking at TSN social media, so in, basically mainly Instagram and Twitter, right? Um, TSN's got two tweets about the Rugby World Cup up right now. Um, one was a picture of the Web Alice Cup from the opening ceremony that basically was just like the Rugby World Cup is about to start. Tune in to um, France versus the All Blacks, right? The first game of the World Cup following the opening ceremony. And there's one other link to an article, uh, like article which seemingly just feels random in the T TSN timeline, that was a post-match article for France versus Uruguay, yeah. uh, which just kind of, I don't know why that one match felt, they felt the need to po post a post-match article on their timeline. Um, it's good. It's better than nothing, I guess. Um, Instagram's got nothing, right? Um, like I said, I mean, I kind of joked about it, but there, there is, there's been more, they've had more social media traction for sure without a doubt for be from Taylor Swift being at the Kansas city chiefs game on Sunday night. Right. Without a yeah. doubt. Has, and fair. And in all honesty, fair enough. It's probably a bigger story that's driving more traffic to their website anyways. But yeah. Um, but I think like that's part of what my question is now kind of becoming right. Like, because I think like TSN and the executives at TSN, like, I don't think are stupid. Like, they're going to put the programming that's going to make them the most money like on. Right. And I think like, I don't know, Stu, let me ask you, like, I feel like, like our Canadian rugby fans, the rugby clubs, rugby players, rugby Canada as a whole, even, are we getting like a little bit of a reality check on like where rugby actually ranks in like the Canadian, like sports culture like where it actually ranks amongst other sports, other events in pop culture, because right now it doesn't feel like it, it, it doesn't feel like it's registering with anybody. That's not already a rugby fan. That's maybe also actively seeking it out. The short answer is yes. The longer answer <laughs> is, but I think it, the longer answer I think relates back to how world rugby 
and Rugby World Cup is dealing not, with the media they're not helping landscape. themselves. Yeah, they're absolutely not. not. So, um, I'm going to say the comparison is to what Formula One was prior to 2016. So, for those that don't know, um, the head honcho of Formula One used to be a guy called Bernie Eccleston, and he. Um, specialized in making sure that Formula One was only showed on subscription channels or like pay to view channels. So they had to pay a fee to watch it. And, you know, there was a Concord agreement of saying that, you know, certain races had to be shown in certain places and have yeah. availability. But he also allowed uh, certain broadcasters to skirt around it. So, and his viewpoint was. He was more interested in the board chairperson of a broadcaster as opposed to fans because the chairperson obviously had more money. So, and this mindset actually suffered, uh, made Formula One suffer because between 2008 and 2016, Formula One's viewership went down across the board. It went down in Europe, which is its uh, central base. It went down in Asia, and it went down in America. Now, in 2016 into 2017, Liberty Media purchased Formula One, and their goal was clear. They wanted to increase viewership in North America and eventually host more races in North America. Now, there is the U.S. Grand Prix that has been held in Austin since 2012. There's also the uh, Canadian Grand Prix that's held in Montreal. And there have been races in um, uh, Sao Paulo in uh, Brazil and in Mexico City. Did they do one in Miami this year too? Well, that's the point I'm getting at, is that when they purchased Formula One, their goal was we want to have more races in uh, the United States. And, you know, Miami was tabled for discussion. Las Vegas was tabled for discussion. You know, New York was tabled for discussion as well. But the problem they had was that the viewership was low in North America. So they had to go about it a different way. So they struck up a deal with ESPN to show all the races on the 2017 season going onwards with a contract in place. and. So that meant that people who already had a sports subscription to ESPN would be able to access the races very easily because ESPN is one of the big sports channels in the United States. But the other thing they did was they encouraged social media content creators yeah, to, take fo- um, to take footage from races and... You know, they couldn't obviously take the entire race and upload it to their YouTube channel, but they could take bits and they could show it and they didn't have to worry about being copyright claimed or things like that. And through that, that helped grow the base to a younger audience, a a younger audience, a audience that had access to money. And when it so and then when uh, Formula One was hosting events in North America, such as the US Grand Prix or the Canadian Grand Prix, they changed it from a three day uh, build up to the race on Sunday to a festival of yeah. motorsport. So that if you went on the Friday for free practice, which, you know, doesn't really gauge anything, mm-hmm. you would still be able to do things and have fun. There would still be things that you could do or try. The opportunity to you know meet some of the drivers, get autograph signings, things like that. Yeah, and so and as a result, you know, as you said, Miami has had a Grand Prix for the past couple of years. Las Vegas will have its first Grand Prix as part of a ten-year contract this year. And That's so cool. Formula One has never been bigger. Now you can argue and say. What about Drive to Survive? And yes, I fully agree. Drive to Survive did carry a lot of the um, initial legwork, but the goal has always been to get more people to come to Formula One races and race weekends, I should say. And that 
should be the mindset of world rugby in my in my opinion it should be if you like you can watch these games you can watch these moments that Mm -hmm. you know like these incredible tries these you know pulsating tackles the you know absolute adulation of the crowd and stuff and we want you to come and enjoy that as well Mm -hmm. at the next tournament at the next big event you know in if your team's not in the world cup we want to be able to say hey you can promote this at the next you know world rugby organized tournament which may be like the for canadians that say it's the america pacific asia championship that's meant to be taking off next year but if that is oh we want you to watch these games but you have to pay for this like massive broadcaster and if we find even 5 seconds of our footage on there, we're going to come at you with the ban hammer and we're going to yeah. threaten your, you know, income from being a content creator. People are just going to go, okay, I won't do that. I'll go follow another sport like formula one, which doesn't come after me just because yeah. I want to show my appreciation. <laughs> it's basically yeah. the old fossils who refuse to modernize. Oh, that's the standard for rugby. At the I think, yeah. Like I, um, I mean, I I completely agree with a lot of that. I think also, like, I mean, I think Drive to Survive um, also help create, like, personality. Well, not so much create, but, like, show off, like, the personalities of all the drivers. Like, those, the drivers in F1 now are, like, they're, they're, like, general public famous. They're not just, like, yeah. racing famous or even, like, sport fan famous, right? Yeah. Like, um the like racing like the the drivers themselves are incredibly popular incredibly fit like they drive to survive turn the drivers into like superstars right which i think you know in rugby where you are we're still a sport where like what how many teams the world cup have players names on the back like three of them yeah england's got it i think scotland's got it somebody a couple other i think wales yeah the red roses were had names on the back yeah Right. And it's like, yeah, like we don't know who like they don't know who like a lot of people necessarily are. Um, The 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 content ban is mind boggling Mm -hmm. like because like you want to like but it's like the content ban is mind boggling because it's like obviously you want people to um, Mm -hmm. to be able to, like you said, see like a really cool try and want to tune in. But it's also like it helps just, you know, people retweet things or like show things or get something trending that's like you know so that maybe like people that aren't rugby fans might have a chance to see it right because it's like if if people can't see it then people aren't gonna watch it yeah right and it's like it kind of crosses that and i mean even a broadcaster like tsn right which you would think would have like an invested interest in like making sure people know about it like I was listening to like Overdrive on the way home, like TSN's like big like radio show on 1050 in Toronto, right? And the the hosts were talking about how great the weekend of sports was and how great it the next one's gonna be because they're like the Ryder Cup or something also happens this weekend, right? And they were like they spent like a like some time listing off all the great sports events that happened this weekend and didn't mention the rugby world cup once. No. And right. And it's like, and that's to me, I'm like, well, one, like that's the biggest radio show on the official broadcaster for the World Cup in Canada talking about how great the sports weekend was. And they don't mention the Rugby World Cup. Like that seems like a problem to me. Not so much because the host didn't mention the World Cup, but it's like that's how little the world, the tournament seems to be registering here. That yeah, it's no even happening is that TSN themselves, the host, the people that work for the official broadcaster don't even seem to know that it's happening. And because yeah. they don't know it, seem to know it's happening. Like I, like I said, it's like I feel like unless you are a rugby fan, like like as I mean, like even like during the women's world cup, I feel like I had people at work that knew I loved rugby, like asking me about like the women's world cup. Um the zone has done some good coverage of six nations. I usually get like asked about that when that's happening and stuff. It's like, I haven't had like a single random conversation about somebody that like at work that I'm like, I know doesn't watch rugby, but they're like, Oh, Hey, I saw a rugby game on the weekend. 
or whatever. Like it's not yeah. happening. And that, like, and it's it's not picking up at all. And like it's it's kind of it's concerning. And well, this is the thing, you know, we've talked about, you know, because Canada's not in the World Cup, maybe there isn't as much of a drive for, for TSN. TSN think, yeah, to, for TSN. But, but this so an article is coming from the Telegraph in the UK. And it says that oh, wow. the Rugby World Cup uh, is not certain to remain entirely free to air in the UK uh, with a radical shakeup of how it's both staged and broadcast. And the long story is that whilst the Women's World Cup will be held in England in 2025 and will remain free to air in the UK there, um, Alan Giplin, uh, sorry, Alan Gilpin of World Rugby says that his priority is for the World Cup to reach the widest possible audience to help grow interest in the game, but warned that it had to be balanced by generating the revenues required to capitalize yeah. on that. And Agreed. Uh, is it, so under UK law, only the Rugby World Cup final, the final game, has to be shown on free-to-air TV. And, uh, you know, there's been bids by, you know, Sky Sports and other broadcasters to get the rights for the tournament, but yeah. they would then be forced to watch the final, um, to put the final on free to air TV. And I think that the, if they were to do this, if they were to only show the World Cup final on uh, free to air TV and the tournament itself would be behind a paywall, it would kill any interest in the sport in the UK. And to put uh, to put this in context, um back in 2005, uh cricket uh was available on free to air in England. And there's a tournament that gets held every two years between England and Australia called the Ashes. It's basically like the yeah. Lions series but for cricket. And in 2005, England won the tournament for the first time in a long time, and it was across multiple TV um, platforms. Uh, you know, it was featured on the news regularly. People were watching it live. And then the England Cricket Board went to the government and said, we would like the free-to-air law changed so that cricket is put behind a paywall so we can make more money for it. And then cricket was then put on Sky Sports. And when England won the Ashes in 2009, no one cared because no one had been able to see it because fewer people have access to uh, Sky Sports than they do the free-to-air channels in the UK. And having seen that happen to cricket, I guarantee that would happen to rugby in the UK if this stupid decision was made. Okay, so um, because I want to kind of play devil's advocate with this one. It's not necessarily that I disagree with you, but I feel like this is a, a point that devil's advocate kind of needs to come out a little bit. Because I also got, like in having these conversations on Twitter, I also got a couple people, one of the big things with the TSN is people complaining about having to pay for that, you know, that $8 upgrade for like the TSN plus service that's out there, right? Yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, people have the right to complain about that, anything that they pay for, right? But, um, so I'm not necessarily ups mad about people complaining. But um, if I may play devil's advocate on this, and maybe there's a cultural difference between Canada, North America, and the UK, why don't people want to pay for rugby? It's probably, let me put it like this way, in the sense that, you would have to pay for TSN, correct? You and you would also TSN have to pay... Was. Yeah, but you'd have to pay for TSN yeah. on top of the channels you already have. And then okay. maybe you'd have to pay for Sportsnet as well. But well, it, but what, let, 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 me, let me explain the situation so I can try and do the cultural thing. Um, but let's say uh, TSN is now $30 a month. And... Okay. You may not even get access to all the sports channels. If you want certain extra sports channels, you have to pay an extra 10 bucks. But let's yeah. say you get TSN 1, 2, and 3. And, you know, all the sports are, you know, there's no conflicting sports or anything. 
and then for TSN four and five, which have you know, let's say they have rugby or they have uh, the rugby championship or anything going on, you have to pay an extra ten bucks for that. But they may put uh, the rugby on TSN four, they may put on TSN five. So and you don't know which, so you have to pay another ten bucks on top. So you basically you're paying fifty bucks for TSN in the hopes that you get rugby. And then let's say that you say, okay, you know, you're a fan of CFL. So you say, I'm going to get TSN and I'm going to pay the 50 bucks a month and I'm going to go like, do it like that. And then let's say Sportsnet comes along and says, actually, we're going to show the World Cup. But if you want to show that, you then have to pay 40 bucks to us because that's the standard subscription for Sportsnet. And that's so that's basically like the situation is in the UK is that Sky Sports is um, not cheap to get. And if you're not a fan of certain sports it can those costs can quickly increase and increase and increase and then there's also just from a cultural perspective so there's like the bbc and itv Mm -hmm. channel four and those are um yeah they're cornerstones of british media culture so the bbc you know famous around the world doesn't have any commercials so you know that you're getting uninterrupted games ITV, they they've had the rights to the Rugby World Cup for at least twenty years, definitely longer. But that's just from like my own personal recollection. Um, you know, Channel Four, they've been showing some of the Wales games as well, and you know, doing when they did their tour to Argentina, that was on Channel Four as well. And more, and the big one, the Six Nations, has always been on either the BBC or the BBC and ITV. So, mm-hmm. and when the rights for the Six Nations come up, they are always contested, and there's always like lots of money being thrown around by Sky and now more recently Amazon to get the rights for these games. But the cultural stronghold that certain channels have, like the BBC and ITV means that moving it to a OTP, OTT, which is over-the-top broadcaster, for a fee that people say is like it's unfair to pay when they have been so accustomed to it being on free-to-air television. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and in the UK, like I said, the... Uh, Rugby World Cup final that is legally has to be on free to air TV. Um, the FIFA World Cup uh, final tournament, include like all the games that has to be on free to air TV. The UEFA Euros that has to be on free to air TV as well. So there's obviously so obviously football, world's biggest sport, rugby, one of the biggest sports in the world, and. It's so for people to say like, oh, it has to be behind a paywall is especially for a lot of people who have been watching those games free all their life to now be like, oh, you have to pay this huge fee to watch this, to watch the sport you love. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can't just do it for like a couple months at a time. You have to do an annual contract. And if you break the contract, you have to pay out more. It's it's a lot of hassle that a lot of people in the UK especially do not want to deal with. And that's so when, so when people say like, Oh, it's either pay this fee to watch it on this channel or don't watch it. Most people will be like, okay, I won't watch it. Then this eyes off the product and the downward spiral begins. So that see, so that feels like I don't know. I guess that feels like a bit of a different situation than what we have here. Because I mean, like here, you got to pay for everything, right? Like, hmm. um, you know, I'm thinking like, you know, CBC, I guess, is a free channel, right? And that obviously will have Olympic esque sports, right? Which yeah. includes rugby sevens, which is cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and like two hockey games a week, two to three hockey ga- NHL games a week, really, is all that's on CBC. Yeah. Um. But like beyond that, like if you want to watch the NHL, you're paying for Sportsnet. Um, mm-hmm. You're probably also paying for TSN if you want to watch all 82 games of your favorite Canadian team, because TSN owns the regional rights to some of those teams too. Um, so that's, I mean, that's 
to subscription. You got to pay for if you want to watch the Blue Jays, if you want to watch the Raptors, you want to watch um, NFL, you want to watch CFL, you want to watch anything like you're paying for it, um, yeah. which I guess it makes that maybe a little bit different here because like we pay for everything. Um, and obviously, like you would add up like, you know, the different subscriptions. I mean, like, again, like for me, like I don't mind paying for TSN because I don't just watch rugby. I watch other sports too. So it feels like more worth its money. Maybe if you're somebody that just wants the rugby world cup, like, I don't know, like you can pay for TS, you can pay for a TSN go up uh, TSN plus package. That's only $8 a month though. And it still has the rugby world cup on it. If you just watch the rugby world cup, that's two months right or that's two months that's 16 dollars. there's 48 games at the rugby world cup that's 33 cents a game right um which isn't that expensive um but yeah we're all still complaining about it um right and it's like even if it's on tsn one through five like you're still paying for that like if you're watching it on cable right like you're still paying for that to be part of your cable package um so I, I don't know. I feel I guess that's maybe kind of a different situation, maybe between the UK and Canada. Um, right? Like if everything was free, which kind of sounds like for a lot of things, that's kind of how it seems like you're kind of describing that. There's a yeah. lot of major sports that are like legally have to be free. Um, yeah, yeah I, I guess I can kind of see why people in the UK might be mm. angry about that. But like having to pay for TSN to watch sports just kind of feels like the standard here. Um, you can complain about the service once you're paying for it. I'm not saying yeah. you know, I don't. I'm not saying that not to complain if you don't like what TSN's doing. Like, go by all means, go complain. But like, um, but like, I don't know. I think the biggest issue is there seems to be just a lack of outside of rugby fans. There just seems to be a lack of like Canadian culture that's interested in the Rugby World Cup, and mm. I'm not like I think it's an interesting conversation to have to like start talking about it. But like, I'm not sure what you do to fix this. Like I'm genuine. Like, what do we have to do to make people like on a wider scale, like make people care about the rugby world cup? Like how do you get the rugby world cup in front of people that aren't um, rugby fans to like kind of grow that element of the game? Um, Cause like, and I've also like, I've been thinking two of just like my own like viewing habits and trying to like kind of reflect on that a little bit and like you know like one of the benefits of rugby any rugby whether that's you know rugby canada the arrows whatever being on tsn we always said like one of the big benefits was like people stumbling across it like channel surfing or um the tv gets left on in a bar right and one of the things I've been kind of thinking about is like, so the thing I said at the start of this conversation was like, I haven't paid for cable in like eight years. So like, I don't channel surf or whatever. I suppose like I go to bars. So I suppose it's cool. If something's left on, but it's like when you're like going through the TSN app or the TSN browser, like web browser, it's like, how often do you click on a sport or an event that you don't care about? Rarely. Like, yeah. Like, and I'm like, I'm looking at like TSN. I'm like, I see a lot of soccer on TSN all the time. I can tell you I've clicked on it exactly zero times. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, just because like, okay, like the Rugby World Cup logo is going to be there. All the games are on demand. But like, how many people are just like, oh, cool, Rugby World Cup and just keep scrolling and click on like Argos versus Blue Bombers or click on like, you know, the uh, NHL preseason game or like, AEW wrestling or sailing yeah. UFC or whatever they want to watch. Right. Like, um, right. And it's like, I think even like, like, I don't know, like you're, we're, ta you're, you're talking about like the old, old methods or like of like ways of viewing like social media, like not letting people like clip content out of the rugby yeah. world cup and show video or anything, right. Or create content surrounding the rugby world cup with footage. Right. And I'm also just kind of like, man, it, it's just assuming that if you put it on a platform like TSN, people are going to watch that. Is that also like slowly becoming an outdated idea? Yeah, I, right? I like, definitely think it is. Because even like if you take like through TSN, right? I'm like, 
I don't really click on sports that I don't want to watch, but you can take that over to like any form of streaming service, right? Go to Crave TV, Disney Plus, Netflix, whatever you may want to watch, right? There's going to be like X amount of movies and TV shows that you want to watch and then X amount of things you don't care about, right? And like how often do you click on the thing you don't care about? You don't. Like if people, if people are cutting cable out, even though, like, if you're cutting cable out and then paying for, like, a bunch of streaming services, it's kind of hilarious because it's kind of like, like a new version of cable because you're still paying for a lot of random packages and stuff. But, like, if you're if people are just using streaming services to watch things primarily now, like, channel surfing is feels like it's a thing that's going to slowly die anyways. Yeah. And, like, is that, like, that just having a game on TSN doesn't feel like it's has the same impact as it may once have had right because in the same way like say an arrows games on tsn and somebody sees like the arrows logo versus new york or whatever right um like how often are people seeing that and just scrolling by in the same way that i might see like a premier league lacrosse game and just be like yeah i don't care about that scroll by click on my rugby game yeah right? like it's i feel like Rug, rug I, it, it's weird it's weird because i feel like most of this world cup in all honesty like other than the fact that the games have been great everything around it seems to be somewhat negative like i think we're like yeah and like right now like there's a lot of negativity about the media and like the and not so much the like not people in the media but just like the way it's being engaged with and i mean like like genuinely like it, it i it's kind of concerning to me that i think like in canada people people don't care about this yeah, no, I they well, don't. Nobody cares. R rugby is a niche enough sport as it is, and yeah. you know, if the if you and if you don't have a stake in it, in this case, being yeah. you know your national team taking part, a lot of people it's even more niche aren't going to care. But like, but that's the thing, right? Is like you know, there's all those there's tweets all the time about like you know, and like there was a couple games this week. I think Australia versus Wales was on like TSN two or something. But yeah. it's like there's always the like the tweets that come out are always like the oh like like I can't believe this is on instead of rugby and it'd be like man like you can't believe, like and sometimes it's like you read the tweet and it's like you can't believe a CFL game is on instead of rugby like it's, it's the CFL like it's a big deal like in Canada yeah. especially for TSN or like NCAA football again is a the big deal UFC big deal golf tennis basketball baseball whatever else you can put on like even lacrosse even lacrosse is yeah. something it's like that's our national sport technically like there's a lot of people that watch lacrosse and it's like like rugby rugby is a super niche sport and mm -hmm. i feel like we're learning right now that it's like in canada especially it's definitely a niche sport yeah and like i think tsn might just be treating it like it's a niche sport um, which I think yeah. is ultimately pretty concerning for um, rug rugby fans. Rugby Canada should be a little worried about. Rug mm -hmm. That's one thing I I think in like I know rugby Canada is not in this tournament, but it would kind of be nice to see them be like, hey, like this is where you can watch rugby games. Like it's like you know here's a big like I don't know like promote the fact a little bit like to try to grow with the game a little even though you're not there it'll be like oh like let's watch the like this is where you can watch the rugby world cup or like go to like this bar because they're having like a watch party or something i don't know um because it's like yeah like i don't know you don't especially with that social me like that basically what seems like a social media ban for like all footage of it which is stupid but like it seems like it's just really flying under the radar of a lot of people, which is not great, really. But also, yeah. maybe it's just like, I don't know, maybe it's we just have to get used to and accept the fact that we like a super niche sport, at least in this country. Anyways. I guess, like... I guess so. But, you know, we, we've we been talking a lot about uh, the Rugby World Cup, the final round of the pool stage will be taking part this coming weekend. Mm -hmm. So let's do our predictions. Now, we 
are recording this before the Uruguay and Namibia game. We gave those predictions last week, so we'll move on to Japan versus Samoa. Derek, which one? Just give me a name. Uh, let's go Japan. Yeah, that's fair. I'm going to go with Japan as well. I think they're just ahead. And next up, New Zealand versus Italy. I'm going to go with the All Blacks on this one. Uh yeah, I don't uh I don't exactly know why you wouldn't go with the All Blacks um on this one. Seems All like right. you know, lock that in. And and in Paul D we have a Southern American clash between Argentina and Chile. Uh seeing as it's Argentina and not Argentina fifteen, I will yeah. be going with Los Pumas for this one. Derek? Yeah, but that's still a rivalry, right? Do you think Chile's going to be a little bit more up for it? Might be a little bit spicy, but um, I, I think they'll be up for it. But I don't think they'll be. Yeah, I don't know. yeah, you got to give the edge to Argentina on this one. All right, now we have a bit of a close a closer clash. It is Fiji versus Georgia. Ooh, um, Fiji I think has looked a lot better than Georgia in the tournament. Mm-hmm. Um. And man, this would be huge for Fiji, considering how tight this group is. What do you, like? I guess it's what do you want to see? Do you want to see absolute chaos in the group? Because if Georgia wins, that's going to be that pool C is wild. Um, yeah. so Georgia for chaos, but I think I'm going to still pull for Fiji to come out with the win. But okay. I kind of want Georgia to win. I'm going to pick Fiji though, but I kind of want Georgia to win. Yeah, my my heart wants to go for Georgia, but. You know, Fiji, they've been the one pulling off upsets. They, you know, they nearly beat Wales if it wasn't for that knock on at the end. They did comfortably beat Australia. They will be playing later. Is that an upset? So I... Fiji's mm. ranked higher than Australia. <laughs> yeah, well, they are now, but uh, so I'm going to go with That's true. Fiji as well. Uh, next up, Scotland versus Romania. If this had taken place last year, I would have been on the fence for Romania, but they have just not been great this year. I'll be going with Scotland. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with Scotland on this one, too. Okay, we have the uh, another Pool C clash. Australia versus Portugal. I am going to be very rude, and I'm going to pick Portugal. Ha! Um, I respect it. That's hilarious. Um, Australia has been bad, but I don't think they're that bad. Um, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna back the Wallabies still. Mate, it's not rugby, mate. It can, we we can beat Portugal on our day, whether that's actually Sunday or not is a completely different question. Is that your Australian <laughs> accent? That needs that's work. my that's my Eddie Jones, mate. Yeah, that's this that needs and, that needs work. All right, and closing out the weekend, it is South Africa versus Tonga. So I will be going. I you know they did suffer uh, a brutal loss, but yeah. I will be going with the South Africans on this one. You as well? Oh yeah, yeah. No South Africa. All right. Yeah. So those are the games this weekend. Actually, let me just. <laughs> what you're gonna check for uh, the token Uruguay Wednesday game next week? What, no, I, game, what game are you going to make me pick far, far too early in advance? No, I think uh, uh, this is the final Wednesday game. And if you want to catch any of those games, well, we've already been talking about them long enough. You can be watching them on TSN or TSN+. Plus. And if you are looking to catch the second of the England versus Canada games, you can find that on TSN+, Plus or on the England YouTube channel. Take your pick. And if you enjoy this episode, be sure to check out more as well as our written pieces on our website, therougerugby.ca. We also have our podcast on Spotify, S4P, and Apple Podcasts. You can find us on YouTube at The Rouge Rugby with episodes of the podcast as well as extra interviews with players and coaches. Make sure to like and subscribe and hit the bell notification to stay up to date with all our videos. We also are available across social media, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Threads, all at the Rouge Rugby. Derek, where can the fine people find you on social media? Um, at Brissette the Jet uh, across all social media platforms. And you can find me across social media at Hardman, spell H4RDMAN. Well, that's where we're going to end this episode. Derek, thank you for joining me, and thank you all for joining us for another episode of the Rouge Rugby Podcast, where we talk about real Canadian rugby. We hope you can join us again next time.